All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids and we're back for another um, Jossum Shark webinar series. So uh, make sure if you've missed some of them, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. Stay tuned. Uh, we have a few more weeks we're doing this as well. Um, and today I'm really excited about this session and hosting it because salmon sharks absolutely fascinate me. Um, I feel like not a lot of people have seen them. Uh, there's still a lot we don't know about them and just definitely a species that is on my bucket list for sure. So really excited to have um, Andy here with us, Andy J. Hart, and uh, he's currently the VP of Animal Care and Conservation at the Philip and, let me see if I make sure, this is a long one, I want to make sure I get it right, Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science, but has nearly uh, 25 years of experience working in animal care. You may have seen Andy on Shark Week shows. He was consulting and working with them, um, making sure the science and the information was correct. Uh, so maybe a familiar face or you've seen his work before. So we are so excited to have you. So thank you for sharing your time and I'm gonna turn it over and let you get started. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jillian. Let's see, I'm gonna do the screen share here. All right. So as Jillian said, I'm the uh, Vice President of Animal Husbandry and Marine Conservation here at the Frost Science Museum in downtown Miami. Um, for me, this has been a labor of love uh, that started very early on. Uh, this was me way back when. Uh, I've had a fascination for fish uh, since the being very young age, um, and then was able to, through my dad, be able to learn how to snorkel at the age of around four or five. Saw so my first shark, which was a Caribbean reef shark. It was about six feet long at the ripe young age of about six years old. So that was a very life-changing experience for me. I knew right then and there I wanted to work with sharks uh, and followed that passion all growing up, read every book I could get about sharks. I certainly wish there was an organization like Sharks for Kids around uh, when I was younger. Uh, but for me, my background started uh, at age 15. Um, I did two things. I did a, a a research project at the Bimini Shark Lab uh, through a program called Earthwatch. Uh, and I also started working at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Uh, this was a high school student summer program. I worked there through high school from the age of about 15 on, uh, selling tickets, wearing the puffin costume, making sure kids didn't spit into the exhibits, all that fun stuff. Um, but then once I got into college, I started college at Eckerd College in St. Pete, Florida. Um, once I got into college, I got into the animal care side of things, working at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Uh, what I really liked about the aquarium environment was that I could be hands-on with animals every day. It wasn't all the time in the library working on grants for the, for the limited field time we had. So I got to work hands-on with animals every day. But I also got to introduce, introduce people to animals and get to observe that amazing thing that happens between guests of an aquarium through the window and seeing animals uh, swimming around, interacting with each other, and having that face-to-nose experience with a large shark or a small coral. Uh, I really like that environment of working in a public aquarium. Uh, outside of college, or basically as I was finishing college, I got an offer to help build and open the aquarium at Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, eventually came back to the National Aquarium, worked there in both their Baltimore and Washington, D.C. locations. And while working at the National Aquarium, I was offered the opportunity to be the shark advisor for the Discovery Channel. And as Jillian said, was able to review content, make sure that it was accurate, uh, kind of go through some of the storylines. And then in 2012, I left to open the Ripley's Aquarium of Canada in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, and then in 2015, came here to the Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science. So uh, in total, I've opened three brand new aquariums. And each time I say, I'm never going to do that again. But... Uh, they are super, certainly a lot of fun to do. Um, just a little bit about background. You know, there's a lot of kids on, on screen today. What I would encourage you guys is to keep getting involved. Um, I was not the best student around. I was probably a, a B average student. Um, and I heard a lot from a lot of teachers and a lot of people that I couldn't get into marine biology because my grades weren't good enough or I wouldn't want to get into marine biology because it's low pay. And, and yes, it is low pay. But for me, this was a job of passion and I got involved as early as I could. And what I was able to do was to work really hard and got involved in programs like the National Aquarium and Earthwatch and Bimini Shark Lab 
so that I was able to have the opportunities that I that I've had, and I've had an amazing career working with animals, um, uh, and, and find myself in a great position now here in Miami. So I encourage you, kids, don't be just you know don't be defeated if you feel like you don't have the grades. You can apply yourself somewhere else if you have the grades. Uh, certainly keep keep at it, keep at the schoolwork because excellent grades will get you a lot further than hard, hard work. But hard work and excellent grades uh, will, as a combo will be even better. Uh, so. My talk today is about the salmon shark. Uh, it is a cousin of the great white shark, the mako shark, and it has a very close cousin named the poor beagle. Uh, the poor beagle and the salmon shark are almost identical species. One lives in the Atlantic and the salmon shark lives in the Pacific. Uh, they can reach about 10 feet length, uh, 900 pounds. The average salmon shark is between seven and nine feet and roughly 500 pounds. So although these are not really long sharks, they are very robust and very heavy. Also, despite what you've heard, you may read in many places, the Mako shark is the fastest shark in the ocean. The US Navy has clocked salmon sharks at a speed of 55 miles per hour. So that's a, from every bit of research I've done, that is the fastest shark in the world. The other really cool thing about this whole family of sharks is they can, although they're cold-blooded animals, raise their body temperature. Uh, this is a critically important for animals like the poor beagle and the salmon shark that live in very cold water, but the salmon shark can raise its body temperature 14 degrees Fahrenheit over the surrounding water temperature, which is a really interesting uh, feature for these animals, evolutionary feature for these animals to have to live in these very cold environments. Salmon sharks also need really high bursts of speed and a lot of energy to be able to catch their food, the salmon. So we went about trying to figure out where we would film this species. It Barely few people have ever been in the water with. To my knowledge, before we went to Alaska, the only person that had been swimming with salmon sharks was a photographer named Doug Perrine and there was a National Geographic crew that went up to look at salmon sharks that shot pretty much remotely with pole cameras and GoPros. So we were the first big crew to go and actually try to engage with these animals. Looking at the tagging data we, we were able to find probably the best places to go and that was in Prince William Sound in Alaska. So in 2009 we put a small team together to go out and essentially just prototype whether this was possible before we pitched it to Discovery Channel for Shark Week. Uh, we've got underwater cinematographers, uh, an Alaskan guide, an engineer, and the guy in the middle, Marty Snyderman, is a, is a really well-known underwater photographer. So he was our token old guy on the trip, so in case we were getting into any problems, uh, we'd let Marty deal with it. So this is the area we were at. Um, this is Prince William Sound at the southern part of Alaska, southeast part of Alaska. The two towns that we based out of were Whittier, the red dot on the left, and Cordova, the red dot on the right. Cordova has no roads going to it from the mainland. The only way to get there is airplane and by boat. So we only use Cordova for fueling up and getting bait. The area where the red arrow is, is Gravina Sound um, or Gravina Fjord. That's where we were looking for the, the uh, shark activity and Whittier, the town on the left, is where we put in because we had boats on trailers and we had to get all of our gear in. So. It's a 140 mile boat ride from Whittier to uh, Port Gravina. And although you probably were thinking something along the lines of large ships like Deadliest Catch and large research vessels, uh, these were our boats for a four week venture into the wilds of Alaska. It's a 20 foot center console and a 17 foot center console that we had to get all of our gear and all of our crew in. Uh, so we started by building a, a very lightweight aluminum shark cage. As I mentioned, nobody had ever been in the water really with this species. We didn't know if they would mouth things or bite things to see what they were, whether they were aggressive, whether they were uh, shy and reclusive. So we wanted to make sure we had a shark cage just in case. Uh, so built out of aircraft aluminum. So this is what the shark cage looked like torn down because space was a premium. So we had to fit 1,200 pounds of guys, six different guys, all of our gear, dive gear, filming gear, and this shark cage into these two little boats. And we left Whittier, Alaska for a 10 hour, 140 mile boat ride uh, in these small boats. Some of the seas that we got to when we got to the main uh, shipping channel were nine foot seas and 17 foot boats. That's a, a very hair raising experience, I can tell you. <clears throat> but we saw some amazing things along the way. Uh, this is one of the icebergs we saw. Uh, an interesting fact about icebergs, only about a third of the iceberg is above the water. Two thirds of the iceberg is below the water surface. And we actually ran up to one of the icebergs to see if we could get on it and get a chip of ice for our uh, cooler. Um, and what happened is part of the iceberg under the water broke out 
and almost sank our boat. So we saw fine bubbles coming up and we put the boats in reverse really fast and were able to avoid disaster uh, on day one of our trip. <clears throat> but all of our crew, uh, we dressed in dry suits. Uh, surrounding water temperature was between 38 and 40 degrees. So in case we got splashed or the boats flipped for some reason, we were uh, protected against the elements, but a really long ride for 10 hours that way. We didn't have any Marriott hotels or Hilton hotels. Uh, this area has no development whatsoever. Um, so this was our, our camping location for four weeks. Now keep in mind, we were probably within two miles of 50 brown bears, which are the same as grizzly bears, uh, and probably about 50 black bears as well. So uh, certainly some treacherous locations to be in for a small team of six. <clears throat> but I have to say this was my view for four weeks, uh, certainly better than any five-star hotel I've ever stayed in. So uh, this was a, an amazing experience. And our goal for the, this trip, again, was to see if we could get in the water with salmon sharks, see what the locations were, were like, see what the behaviors were, and then we would pitch this to Discovery uh, to film a Shark Week show. So uh, we basically set up this mooring system. We kept all of our food on the boats at night so that the bears uh, would not invade our camp, uh, which is a real risk when you're in this type of environment. We were bringing the boats in every morning. That way we, nobody had to swim out in the freezing cold uh, water to, to go get the boats. So we would actually had this tether system that we could pull the ships in, pull the boats in from the mooring. Every evening after we would film, we'd come to our editing suite. Uh, we had heard horror stories of mosquitoes the size of hummingbirds. Um, luckily, when we went, the mosquitoes weren't terrible, but we did have an editing suite. So all the footage on our cameras would get dumped to hard drives and we'd do that every evening. Again, there's no grocery store down the, uh, down the road. So we had to get all of our drinking water and our cooking water from the waterfalls. Uh, one of the things that's really risky in Alaska or camping anywhere is a, a parasite known as Giardia. So we filtered all that water and um, actually it was amazingly fresh tasting water. We did all of our cooking uh, by campfire. Uh, this was another guy named Andy, he was our engineer, but an amazing cook. He was a, an Eagle Scout. So if any of you are in the Boy Scouts, keep with it because uh, he was amazing at cooking for us. Uh, he cooked every meal in a Dutch oven like this. This was us deploying our, deploying our shark cage. Again, we just wanted to make sure that we had some protection in case the animals were a bit more aggressive than we uh, were expecting. And then we took the four hour boat ride into Cordova to the salmon processing plant where we would get heads and tails and lovely uh, blood and guts to use as chum. Any of you guys have seen Shark Week, you know that chumming is a, a, a normal activity to, to attract sharks. They're attracted by that sense of smell. That smell goes for miles and miles and miles. And uh, for example, an adult lemon shark we know can detect one drop of blood in an Olympic sized swimming pool. So their sense of smell is really sensitive. That's oftentimes what they'll use first to orient themselves to food. So we did this for two weeks. We chummed and we probably had a chum slick that went from Prince William Sound all the way to Vancouver. And we had zero shark activity whatsoever. So four weeks in the uh, Alaskan wilderness, not a single shark, but that's part of filming. So what do we do? We adapted, we changed our strategy. We get a lot of different glamorous shots and pickup shots so that we could again, sell this uh, package to Discovery. This is a black bear that we saw, tons and tons of bald eagles, probably every three or four trees would have a bald eagle on it. Uh, sea otters, this area is very close to Valdez, Alaska, where the Exxon Valdez ran aground. Um, sea otters had a lot of problems with oil pollution. There's still a high level of birth defects within the sea otters, but we saw a great comeback of this species in that area, which was good to see. And then we spent a lot of time filming salmon. This is our cameraman, Mark Brackley. Uh, him and I had worked on a lot of shark weeks together. He's filming spawning of salmon. The salmon come from the ocean at the end of every summer. They come into the freshwater streams and rivers where they were born, where they were hatched out of eggs. They come back to those very same streams and rivers and they lay their eggs and they build their nests. So we did a lot of filming of the salmon. We did sell this to Discovery Channel and in 2012, uh, so three years later, we had a couple good years of good information, refined when we should go. What we realized is that the first year we went, we probably went a week too late. We also had unusually wet summer that summer. There were nights, which was not a lot of fun when sleeping in a tent, where we had nine inches of rain in one night. So we were in a really rainy time, which is part of why we, I think, missed the sharks. But July 2012, we went back. Uh, we went to one fjord over, which is Port Fidalgo. 
as you can see Valdez in the top there. And you think going back with a huge budget for Discovery Shark Week film, we'd have better boat accommodations. We did, this was our big boat, it's a 40 foot boat that at least had a cabin. This time we brought a paramedic, this is Mike Hudson. He's our uh, paramedic EMT in case anything went south. Um, but unfortunately I was relegated to the small boat yet again, but honestly that was a pretty fun ride. So this time we actually did stay at one of the only places in the area that you can stay. It's called Ravencroft Lodge. Uh, before we started working there, Ravencroft Lodge was entirely 100% hunting and fishing lodge. Um, so all summer long from about May to early September, they were book solid uh, serving the fishing and hunting community. So primarily one of the fish that they would fish would be halibut, rockfish, salmon, but they actually in the early days did a lot of uh, fishing for salmon sharks. This is the lodge, so obviously our conditions were, were far better than the first year we went. So we then went out and started to film. This is a phantom camera. It shoots, uh, it can be a super slow motion camera, a thousand frames per second. Um, so this, we were trying to get super slow motion footage of these animals. They were known to breach like the great white shark does. And on day one, this was the, the behavior we wanted to see. Everybody says Jaws isn't real, but this species of shark actually is one of the only ones that I've worked with that spends a good deal of time with their dorsal fin out of the water, just like you see in the movie Jaws, just like you see in the Shark Week shows. Um, but they, this species spends about 60 to 80% of their day in the top six feet of the water column. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but you'd see these sharks swimming these big circular patterns at the surface. And then what we would do is we would jump in and try to swim into the center of that circle try to get the sharks to circle around us. What we found out very early on is they did not like scuba diving at all. They did not like the bubbles from scuba gear. They would be very loud and they would take off. We would get no close encounters. The other interesting thing, if for a dry suit, a dry suit is meant to keep you dry. It's a pocket of air around your body, which makes it very hard to free dive in. So we ended up having to uh, do all of our in-water work with uh, wetsuits. Unfortunately, with wetsuits, it actually lets all the water in first, which is very, very cold. Um, so we actually did the whole trip uh, doing wetsuit diving and free diving with these salmon sharks. But this is what you'd see at first. The water was really murky. It's very green. It's about 4,000 feet deep. The light doesn't penetrate very far. And on the top six to eight feet of water is a lot of fresh water sitting on top of that heavy cold salt water. That's from all the streams and rivers that run into this fjord. And that's called a halocline. So that's what the term is called with salt water and fresh water mixing. Again, it's called a halo climb. So this is what you'd see. You'd see this dark smudge out in the distance, and then you'd hope there was a shark. And then if you were lucky, they'd come really close. These are very dark animals. They've got counter shading. Counter shading is so that other predatory animals don't see this. When they look down, they don't see it. If they look up with the light of the surface, they've got that really bright white belly called counter shading, which helps them uh, hide. But these are the kind of type of encounters we would get. Very close encounters with this species. You'd get, uh, you know, within two, three feet of them. This is Mark, our camera guy, with one in the background. And then if you're really lucky, you'd got an encounter. This, this, this uh, female is about a foot away from my camera dome. Um, and then I was very lucky for about a year to have one of the best salmon shark photos in the world. Um, this female got really close. Um, we gave all of our trade secrets away to a guy named Andy Murch, who's one of the best shark photographers in the world. Um, a great guy to work with. He's, he's great with educational programs. So we, we told Andy, Mandy had seen this photo, and we told him where we were uh, filming these guys and how we were able to work with them. And uh, Andy, unfortunately, went and got a much better photo than I took. But every still photo has a story. Um, this is that same photo before I edited it. And if you look very closely at the bottom, you'll see uh, my, my friend Mark. He is able to free dive down to 150 feet. So he free dove all the way down and was on his way back up. Saw this female salmon shark and she got spooked a little bit, and came closer to my camera. So I don't, let, don't let the media fool you. Every video shot, every film uh, still photo has a little bit of a backstory to it. So we've got some quick video here just to show what it looked like when these guys would come in. Again, they're like ghosts that come in from the dark. You can't see them very well. And then you get this really gorgeous, uh, very calm, quiet, peaceful encounter with these animals. This is one from the top. You can see how hydrodynamic these species are. They have a very pointed snout that you don't really see from sideways. Uh, they have a really thick double keel near their tail. 
These animals are purely built for speed. Very tall dorsal fin, very powerful tail, uh, very hydrodynamic. A lot of people ask what those little trailers, those, those uh, almost look like streamers on their, their fins are. Those are a type of parasite called a copepod. Um, and what we believe, one of the reasons why they spend a lot of time at the surface is that there is a lot of fresh water there. So we think that they're taking on heat from the sun um, as, they, as they're at the surface so they can warm their body temperature. But we also think that the fresh water at the surface is helping them remove those copepod parasites. Now this is an example of a female that really was not happy that I was there. You can see how fast they can turn on the speed. She came right back to my fins and uh, she was like, okay, you're close enough. But you can see how quickly they're able to turn on that adrenaline and speed when they need it. So the, the behavior in the top right is a breach behavior. That's what we were hoping to get. Unfortunately, the whole time we were there, we spent hundreds of hours trying to get this breach behavior. We had a camera set up on shore on a gimbal. We had boat time. Uh, we'd go to the headwaters of the, uh, the rivers where all the salmon were milling about to try to get them where the salmon were. Uh, spent a lot of time just waiting, a lot of waiting. Anybody who's worked on a, a film crew with animals can tell you waiting is probably 90% of it and then 10% is adventure. And this is what happens when you put a film crew waiting too long. We all pass out and sleep. The daytime length in Alaska is 20 hours of daylight. So we would actually work 20 hours a day. Um, we were able to work very closely with a number of commercial salmon fishermen. Um, I really encourage folks to, to look at sustainable seafood. There's a program called Seafood Watch held by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. You can get an app. It tells you what are the good seafoods to eat. Well, one of the good seafoods to eat is wild Alaskan sea, uh, salmon. It is a well-managed fishery. It's managed very heavily by the Alaskan Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and it's a, it is a very responsible fishing practice. Um, but they let us work with them. Um, and we were able to get footage of uh, what happened in a, in a typical salmon trawl and talk about that as possible bycatch for the salmon shark. Uh, we were also able to explore these uh, kind of inland freshwater tributaries. This is the base of a waterfall where the salmon would run up to uh, spawn. These are uh, male pink salmon. They, their head gets all deformed when it's about ready to be mating time. And they would come to these, these very, very cold, this was 36 degree water, um, very cold pools where they would lay their eggs, another pink salmon. And this is what it was like filming there. Again, we were only in wetsuits, uh, very cold environment to be in. And then all of us were face down in the water filming these salmon and we saw this guy here, which made us ponder, hey, you know what? There's really nobody at the surface that's looking out for our backs. And we were hoping this isn't what we'd see. Um, but we were on, a, luckily we didn't have any bears in the area at that time, but uh, there were many trips up these freshwater streams and rivers that we would see bears. Uh, these are two brown bear cubs. Uh, one of the most dangerous places to be in Alaska is between a brown bear cub and a brown bear mom. Uh, so we had this encounter. We were hiking up this uh, very shallow tidal stream. These two bears came hopping out of the woods, salmon in their mouth. And uh, we were wondering when is the next step going to happen. And uh, eventually mom came out. Uh, mom was a big 10 foot tall when she stood on her back legs. Brown bear, she sniffed the air. Bears have bad eyesight, but an incredible sense of smell. Um, so they were able to pick up the scent of us. She swatted her kids on, her, on their hind end, and they all ran off into the woods, and we were in good shape. But certainly some, some terrifying moments when you're in this type of environment, but a lot of fun. These are stellar sea lions, the largest sea lion in the world. Uh, the males, like this one, can top out at around 1,200 pounds. So what does a Shark Week crew do when we're faced with an adventure and potentially something dangerous? Well, we got to throw people in the water. Uh, so this is Mark. Uh, the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, places stipulations on how close you can get. They, they want us to be able to protect marine mammals, not chase them, not harass them. So we just anchored our boat uh, offshore, about 120 yards offshore, and the stellar sea lions were very interested in what we were. We hopped off the boat. They came out to check out who we were and what we were doing, and uh, they would actually check you out by grabbing your fins, bumping you with their nose. Uh, it was a pretty amazing experience. Uh, again, just another incredible establishing shot. This is some of the most beautiful country in the world. Uh, huge glaciers. And then on the way back from one of our, our outings, we were able to see a, a 
basically an adolescent gray whale. Um, again, we just kind of anchor, stopped the boat, anchored the boat, and she decided to come right up to us. Uh, not afraid at all. We don't know whether she thought the boat was mom. We're not, we're not really sure. Uh, but she allowed us to be um, in really close proximity. She came up to us. She'd rub on the bottom of the boat. And then this is a uh, Mark, our camera guy, getting some underwater footage of it. You can see Mark almost gets hunted like a uh, football through a goalpost by this gray whale's tail. As it, I mean, it has no idea Mark's there and doesn't know its own strength. But Mark almost gets tossed. Those are all barnacles growing on its skin. Barnacles are a small uh, animal that lives in, a, in almost like a, a volcano shaped shell. Luckily Mark didn't get hit, but just an amazing encounter. We spent four hours uh, with this same animal. We swim around, go under our feet. So back to the salmon shark. Uh, again, that's why we were there. We got amazing footage of these sharks. But one of the issues facing salmon sharks uh, is that what we found in the, our three years doing that, there's, there wasn't enough data on why we saw salmon sharks the one year, why we didn't see others. Um, when we were there the second time, we only had about a 10 day window and the sharks disappeared. Where do they go? So we, we knew there was a lot more information that needed to be found out about this species. But in doing our research, we, we did find that Shark, uh, salmon shark numbers had dropped exponentially um, between around 2002 and 2009 when we first went. And everybody assumed that was due to bycatch. You know, bycatch are, are sharks like this that are caught in other fishing industries. Um, so this was a salmon shark that was caught as bycatch in a net. Um, in all of our talks with the commercial salmon fishermen, they're heavily mandated that as soon as they get a shark, they have to immediately process that shark out of the net and get it overboard as quickly as possible. Otherwise, they can uh, get huge fines. Um, and we found that all the, the commercial salmon crews that we talked to actually were very good about it. Uh, they understood the role that salmon shark played in their environment, and they actually uh, did not get much salmon shark bycatch. Unfortunately, I think with the salmon shark problem, this may be one of the only species of sharks that uh, the recreational fishing has actually done a huge damage to this population. These are uh, salmon shark charters, kayak fishing. Um, with the salmon sharks, any person who has a fishing license can get two salmon sharks per day. Uh, now these, as, I, as you saw in the tagging data, are sharks that go to very concentrated areas. There's only about three or four of these big coves, these ports where salmon sharks are known to go. They swim at the surface, so you know if they're there. So it's very easy to be overfished from a recreational standpoint. Now, with our time working there uh, for filming the show, we stayed at Ravencroft Lodge, and as we left, uh, the owner of the lodge, Boone, um, he actually set up Alaska shark dive expeditions. It's, a, it's a, basically a dive expedition through the Ravencroft Lodge that books underwater divers, shark enthusiasts, and photographers uh, to come do shark diving with the salmon sharks and to dive in these pristine waters that most people have never dove before. And his business model now is almost, I think, 80% uh, on kind of ecotourism, photography, and shark diving, and not on hunting and fishing where his entire business was before. So this really was kind of an eco-friendly way to really look at, hey, there's a significant problem going on. We're not having the salmon sharks that we once were. How can we monetize that in a good way that's friendly for the environment? And uh, Boone's been really leading the way uh, in, in those operations out there in Alaska. And it's been great to see. So this show actually did air in 2015 under the, the name Ninja Sharks. Uh, we were actually fused together with another show about extreme sharks. Um, so it, it, the show's available on a number of different formats, iTunes. Um, so if, if anybody's interested, they can check that out. And uh, again, I'm here to answer any questions. Happy to answer any questions. I'm gonna stop my share of the screen and then get back to Jillian. Cool, well, that's incredible. I think just seeing how much effort had to go in to finding them, um, living in the Bahamas where I can go, oh, let's go find some lemon sharks. And we go out and five minutes later, you know, or 20 minutes later, we have sharks. Um, and most people that have dived with sharks or worked with them, they go to a spot because they know they're there. It's fairly easy. Um, 
the Bahamas in particular is, is the shark diving capital of the world because it's easy to find sharks. So yeah. I think it's really interesting for, for people to see um, how much work can actually go into to finding certain animals. And, you know, we've talked about some of the deep sea sharks in the webinars and different species. So I think it's really important for people to see that, yeah, through the magic of TV, everything looks super easy and the sharks are there and you get everything. Um, but how much work and effort and logistics and supplies and team it takes um, to make these trips possible is, is pretty incredible. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's Shark Week makes it look very easy. And there are some amazing people like Neil Watson, Stuart Cove, the Bimini Shark Lab that, that, that have set this up in an amazing way. Um, for those people that, that do get interested in diving with sharks, it's something I highly recommend. I think it's a life-changing experience. Um, I think it, it proves the value of these animals as ambassadors, not as shark fin soup. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of shark diving. There are places that make it very easy. Um, but as we push the, the boundaries, Greenland sharks, uh, my aspiration is to do a diving trip with the Pacific sleeper shark, which is a 20 foot long shark that does live deep. Uh, also in Alaska, maybe I, maybe now that I'm a Florida boy, I, I'm not ready to go back to cold water, <laughs> but um, you know, there's some species out there that really have yet to be filmed uh, and interacted with. And uh, you know, it's not easy, but I think there's a, a big reward. And, and ultimately the, the game plan of this and the goal of this is to get people to care about sharks. Uh, sharks are still being killed at a rate of about 73 million per year. So it's important that people do care about sharks. And also to understand how diverse they are. I mean, kids know, they know white sharks, they know hammerheads. I'm guessing everybody watching probably knows uh, tiger sharks or, you know, the different species of hammerheads. And, and, and so I think it's really important for people to understand how diverse sharks are. There's over 500 different species and just how unique and amazing they are from the different habitats, the, you know, the adaptations they have for the different habitats they live in. And, and so, yeah, showing um, stories like this and having these kind of sharks on Shark Week as well, a different species, I think is, is really exciting. And it's really, really important for people to fully understand what these animals are. Right. And also perseverance, as I mentioned, you know, for me, getting into this business, you know, there's a lot of doubters that say marine biology is no good way to make a career. Uh, go do something else. You're never going to get into school to do marine biology. Certainly with being a straight B, sometimes C, sometimes worse student, you know, there's a lot of people that said, you, you can't do it. Um, I think this, for us, the, the salmon shark was that same perseverance story. We know it can be done. It's just gonna take a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and, and to get there. And, you know, I encourage any student that's out there that does wanna do this for, for a job, we need more shark biologists. We need more marine biologists. We need people that look at marine snails, marine worms, corals. We need, we need a lot of marine scientists and don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Absolutely, I think that's, you know, it is. It's very competitive. There's a lot of people that don't understand it or they have this specific idea of what marine biology looks like. And it's very, very different. There's so many opportunities within that world. So yeah, if you're, as you mentioned, like if you're passionate about this, you'll find a way. You'll, you'll make it work and you'll find your place. So, cool. All right, so we have quite a few people ask, what is your favorite shark? Well, I have to say my favorite shark, hands down, is the tiger shark. Salmon shark is a close second, uh, but tiger shark, I had a first, my first, you know, I saw my first shark at age six, it was a Caribbean reef shark, but first time I really got to work with, uh, with sharks uh, was at the Bimini Shark Lab, and we had about a 14-foot tiger that came up that we tagged, and then I got to push around as a 15-year-old 15, 15 kid pushing around a 14-foot tiger shark to get it swimming after it's tagging. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with tiger sharks, one of the few people to work with tiger sharks in an aquarium environment. And then uh, sh tiger sharks were actually my entry into working with Shark Week um, because they needed someone to be bait on a surfboard uh, with Emma the tiger shark at Tiger Beach next to a fake sea turtle. So luckily Emma chose the, the fake sea turtle. But, uh, you know, so I've worked with tiger sharks a lot. I think they're, you know, they're amazingly intelligent animals. Um, they're very cautious. It, you know, if I were to make the dog equivalent, I'd say it's a big St. Bernard. Um, oftentimes they're goofy, but they really have a lot of power. Um, but, you know, it's amazing that they have this, this incredibly bad reputation being dangerous. But my work with tiger sharks has shown them to be very calculated, very cautious. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've done quite a few dives at Tiger Beach with Miss Emma as well. And, and yeah, they're, they're very, some of them are very bold. Some are very shy. Like they have unique personalities. And whenever I say that to people, they're like, what do you mean? Sharks have personality. They do. They have unique personalities. And I think people are always surprised that tiger sharks just don't come flying in that, you know, you may have one circle for a while. They're watching and it is one species that will make eye contact with you, which is absolutely incredible they really will look at you and there's not a lot of shark species that do that so it's it's really special to be there and you know have a 14 foot tiger shark that is looking right at you and you know um and it's not just this black eye that people talk about there's a soul in there and it's yeah it's it's life-changing being in the water with these animals absolutely um so quite a few people have commented about what is behind you um do you want to talk a little bit about the facility and maybe some of the animals that are in that particular spot? Absolutely. This is uh, my favorite place. This is under our Oculus viewing experience into our Gulfstream exhibit here at the Frost uh, Science Museum. Uh, this is a 500,000 gallon exhibit behind me meant to replicate the open water environment of the Gulfstream, which is literally just three miles straight east from where we are. Um, in this exhibit, we have uh, lesser devil rays, which is a small species of manta ray that gets to be about four and a half, five feet wide. Uh, we have two scalloped hammerhead sharks. We also have two silky sharks. And what you see predominantly in the background is a bait ball of about 7,500 false pilchards. It's a basically a herring species uh, that's native to here in South Florida. And they make this great elaborate uh, schooling ball to help them uh, evade predators. We also have the smallest species of tuna in the Atlantic behind me, which is the little tunny. Uh, so we're lucky enough to be one of the aquariums that's able to, to do these. Again, I got in, involved in aquariums because I really believe um, people's interests like mine might start from watching Shark Week or reading a book. But I really feel like the next step up that, that ladder towards conservation or towards passion is having a, a real life experience. Uh, maybe it's through a piece of acrylic, maybe it's snorkeling. Um, but I really think that people having interactions with, with these animals does help us become better environmental stewards or ambassador species. And then, you know, my real hope is that they don't just leave the aquarium and say, that was a great day, but they leave the aquarium and say, hey, you know what? I do want to learn how to go scuba diving. I do want to learn how to uh, snorkel. Maybe they're going to be that impressed that they want to do uh, a shark dive. Uh, so we at the museum here, we're we have a traditional science museum. We have a uh, state-of-the-art planetarium, and we have a, uh, an amazing aquarium here that has a number of different exhibits, all the aquatic habitats of South Florida, plus a number of other uh, international exhibits like poison dart frogs, uh, poison versus venom, Indo-Pacific coral exhibit. So we've got lots of stuff going on. Yeah, it looks amazing. I've not been yet, so I know it's on my list to, to visit. I cannot wait. Um, I think it just, it sounds like a lot of amazing exhibits to see and, and animals to learn about. So um, for those of you who are in the South Florida area or um, are traveling again, once all of this craziness is over and, and we're all moving around again, definitely make sure you check it out. All right, we have um, a question. Kiefer wants to know how many hammerhead sharks do you guys have there? We have two scalloped hammerhead sharks. All right, I'm just gonna note that he just answered. All right, and then Joshua, age six, wants to know how many fish can a shark eat? But maybe you could talk about what the fish at the aquarium eat and maybe how many, how often they get fed. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, I think one of the misperceptions about sharks is that there's these gluttonous eating machines. Um, you know, sharks actually have a really slow metabolism. Um, there are some species of sharks like a great white, like a tiger that might eat this an, a huge meal of either, a, you know, tiger sharks oftentimes eat sea turtles. Um, great white sharks eat these enormous seals and sea lions. These animals may go a month, potentially longer before their next meal. Um, there are other smaller reef dwelling species of sharks that, that have a little bit faster metabolism uh, that might eat opportunistically, but most sharks eat in the, in the range of about five to 10% of their body weight per week um, in the ocean. Um, we our, our hammerheads behind me and our silky sharks are on the younger age of the spectrum. So we offer them food every day. Um, we pole feed our animals. We actually supplement the food with vitamins and minerals, uh, just like you take your uh, gummy vitamins at home. Um, we do the same thing for our animals here because we actually feed them restaurant quality food it's all the same food that you would get at the best seafood restaurants in town, same quality, 
but the freezing process does remove a little bit of nutrients. So we supplement with vitamins. We offer them food every day. Uh, ours are still probably in more, since they are on the younger side of the spectrum, they're probably in the 15 to 18% of their body weight per week, but we offer them food every day. Interesting. Cool. Um, so somebody else asked, why do you like salmon sharks so much? Like, why did you want to go see them? To me, it's the, the sense of the unknown. I mean, it, it, having worked with Shark Week for so long, it, it was this, okay, we've seen 8 million shows about great white sharks as much as I love them. It's, you know, it's, they're, I've always been an adventurer at heart. And I think one of the things that's very easy to think in 2020 is that the world has been explored. There's nothing new. There's no adventure left. Everything's tame and, and safe. And uh, for me, Alaska was always a place I'd wanted to go. Um, the fact that I can say I tent camped for four weeks in the middle of bear country is something that I will never, ever forget. Um, I think what made the salmon sharks even sweeter was that four weeks of, of misery and camping in the rain. That first day we saw the salmon shark, the second year round, we were so elated. I mean, we were high fives and hugs and um, that, that experience was something I will, I will never forget. Just that excitement of finally that buildup and the, the adventure, every bit of anguish that went into seeing those. But then once I got to really study the sharks, it's very similar to the tiger shark. Although the salmon shark has a very big black eye, there's no people, you can't tell where they're looking. There's no doubt about it by the way their eye moved. They were making eye contact with you. They were looking exactly where you were. These are very visual predators. The interesting thing about the salmon shark is they didn't respond to chum at all. We could put all the bloody juice in the, in, in the world in that um, in the area. They didn't respond to that. What they responded to is visual stimulus. So we could drag a, a shiner like you would use fishing, but we'd take the hook off just to attract it. They would react to that. Uh, they would definitely react to us when we made a swift motion with the camera. Um, so you, there really was, again, as you said, you know, not to, not to, make, not to make it too um, Finding Nemo, but you know, there, is, there is something to these animals. There is a, a, an awareness to these animals that, um, and we could certainly feel that with the salmon sharks, and they were just an amazing species. I think their ability to live in that environment um, to, to do what they do is pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's the, there's definitely a lot more intelligence to these animals than people give them credit for, for sure. Um, somebody, there's been a couple questions about, like you talked about the tenting and, and um, somebody asked what, I think it was Joshua asked, um, what was the, nope, sorry, Noah. How long did it take to plan the entire journey to film those sharks, like how much? And what was the most difficult part of the trip? I mean, it sounds like maybe the tenting, but it looks like there were a lot of challenges. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, we kind of started on this idea in 2008. Um, so it took about a year to really look, scout out an area. Luckily, one of the guys in our film crew is born and raised in Alaska. He'd spent a lot of time in that area. Would we have been able to do that without that kind of insider's ability? He's the one that had the boats. He runs an, uh, you know, a boat dealership in Alaska. Um, so we kind of had an unfair advantage in the fact that we had a lot of resources on the ground that could look into it. But it took a year of planning to pull that off. Um, we we self-funded the first trip, so we all paid our way. We all chipped in for fuel, bought food. Um, Believe it or not, when, when you only got four hours of sleep, the, the tent was the best place on earth. It was dry. We were literally getting rained on all day, living in a dry suit. So peeling out of a dry suit, crawling into a dry, warm tent was the best thing on earth. Um, probably the worst part about camping for four weeks was, you know, we town was a long ways away. So there were a lot of nights where we just had heated up spam, uh, canned ham and rice. And it was, the food, food choices were not, not the best. Yeah, but I think that's, a lot of people don't realize when you go on expeditions or if you're out doing field work on boats and living, like it's, sometimes you see things maybe on TV or you hear things or I guess what everyone posts on their Instagram, right? It looks glamorous and, but you know, field work's hard and it's long days. It's not a nine to five job. You're dealing with weather. Some people get really seasick, um, can, hard conditions, equipment breaks, and that's just basic. That's not adding in, you know, extra elements of being in really remote locations and um, like you mentioned you brought a medic because yeah you're not just going down the street to the hospital it's not if you have an emergency um, and uh, I know Mike I know he's done a lot of wilderness yep. and and you know remote area medical care so yeah it's it's just things that you don't often hear about or think about because 
the final product looks really amazing. And yeah, but there's, it just shows you how much it goes into it. Um, We're, uh, you know, it was, but we had, what we had heard is that area of Alaska, if the weather was decent enough, it'd be about a four hour run for Coast Guard to come pick us up in a helicopter. So we weren't necessarily, I mean, all of us that were on this trip were very familiar with sharks. We'd work with, you know, literally hundreds of species of sharks. Um, but, you know, the, the bear environment was something that, that was a real risk uh, in Alaska. Um, when you're in that part of Alaska, all it takes is tripping on the beach and rolling your ankle and breaking your leg. And, you know, just the smallest things can lead to really bad things when you're that remote. So, Yeah, definitely. Um, see, so Sydney wanted to know why did you pick this job? Well, as I mentioned, you know, I saw my first shark at age six. You know, my dad got me, my dad was a hard hat diver in the Navy, uh, ended up going to work for NOAA. So I was very lucky to be one of those kids that, that age, at age five knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do marine biology. I knew I wanted to work with sharks. Um, so I did kind of take that dual approach where I did an Earthwatch research expedition to see the science and research side of things. Uh, and then I was very lucky to have this, um, Kind of high school fellowship at the National Aquarium. My biology teacher at my high school was a volunteer at the aquarium. She got me into this program. And what I really, you know, I really liked the field work in Bimini, but I also knew that getting into hardcore research meant about nine months of writing grants and in the lab and writing papers where, you know, my, my call to this was really that, that kind of visceral connection to the animals. I wanted to work with animals every day. Um, and my experience working in the aquarium kind of fit both both needs that I or desires that I had was that I could work with animals every single day, but it wasn't just kind of in a silo. I was able to share that experience and see uh, other people have reactions. I was able to, you know, be an educator on the floor. I was able to, you know, we'd, we'd be able to walk out on the floor and talk to adults, kids about what we did at the aquarium. And really it was that blend of both animal care and education that I, I really that struck me with being in public aquariums which has led me to work in aquariums for 30 years cool. um we've had a couple people and one in particular knows one of our team members who's very fascinated by salmon sharks um so with the can you explain a little because you mentioned that the navy had clocked them was it a specific study they were doing or did it happen to be they just you know were in the water or you, do you know what led to them being able to get that speed because obviously we hear short fin mako short fin mako nothing touches it but this is really interesting yeah I, I, it was an obscure paper i don't think they were looking at, at at salmon sharks specifically i think they were looking at a number of different things and they did use you know a normal sounder um, to get to get a, a verified speed of 55 miles an hour. I'm not exactly sure of the specifics. I, we dug it out as we were doing all this intel on salmon sharks and some obscure Navy paper uh, somewhere in the, in, the, in the kind of the stacks of somewhere. Well, I'm probably gonna connect you um, with him after. So, okay. um, and then have you guys, cause obviously they're very rare. Um, that's why not everybody's just going out and doing this. Um, has there been another spot that people have found? Um, because this now, there's a few more photos now and I'm assuming, you know, I know Andy right. at March and I, I know, you know, people go on his trips and stuff, but are there any other spots or is it still kind of to a kind of a confined area? So to my knowledge, all the people doing underwater photography of salmon sharks on a regular basis are, are, are using Ravencroft Lodge and the Alaska shark diving experience. Um, salmon sharks are very interesting in that uh, every year, all the salmon sharks meet up in Prince William Sound because that's where all the salmon are. They probably gorge themselves. They're probably getting a year's worth of food um, in a very short window of time. We also believe that's where mating happens. As soon as the salmon run ends and the sharks leave, the boys go to Russia and Japan, and the girls go down to Canada and California. So it's a segregated population, which is kind of like two different boarding schools. And they meet, and they meet up in Prince William Sound in the summertime. So there have been chance encounters uh, in Southern California where divers and, and, and water people will see salmon sharks. Oftentimes, they'll also see very small baby juvenile salmon sharks in Southern California. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes they're seeing these juvenile salmon sharks wash up on the beach in Southern California. They get this infection of their, their uh, ampullae, their gel-filled pores in their snout that help them with navigation. Um, for some reason, the salmon shark is prone to getting these infections of their, their ampullae 
and they're getting juvenile ones to wash ashore. So what we believe happened is the females come down, they pup in Southern California, and then every year make their way back up to Alaska. But there probably might be some chance encounters, but really Prince William Sound uh, is the hot spot for, for any in-water activity with salmon sharks. And it just shows you for a lot of these species, like protecting very specific locations is critical because obviously they are targeted. Um, and, you know, during these times in their life, particularly um, if they are breeding at that spot at that time, like these are areas that absolutely, you know, need to be protected. So even though it was probably a start of, we just want to go see if we can dive with these animals, we don't know much about them, but now, you know, hopefully it's now creating awareness and a better understanding of, of that, you know, that time of year and, and it, all of this kind of intel that you get really does help with um, legislation, better fisheries management, things like that. So what started out as a just an exciting adventure sounds like it's it's really critical and important for conservation so um and i think that's the case with people don't realize with with diving and photography and things in general um it can be a lot more than just a dive adventure it's it's really become um valuable information so very cool absolutely well, i think bahamas has been a great lead on that they've seen the value of sharks as an ecotourism um, the Bahamas, you know, years ago set itself up as a shark sanctuary. So, you know, obviously a lot of places could take the lead, uh, could take kind of the, the hint that places like Fiji and Bahamas have done in, in saving sharks, because it's not just about ecotourism, but it is about environmental health. Um, sharks are the apex predator. They're the ones keeping everything else in check. Um, so, you know, not only do they have an intrinsic value, uh, you know, an established value as, as is something that's necessary, but they also have this this great value for ecotourism, but as well as just kind of the health of the ocean. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And thank you guys. Um, we, there were so many questions, but thank you guys so much um, for everyone who joined us and for typing all your questions in. And thank you so much, Andy, for your time. Um, make sure if you are in the South Florida area, um, or you're visiting, this is, is an amazing facility. So definitely, um, again, once we're all out and about, uh, it'll be a great place to, to get out and explore and learn a little bit more and, and see that incredible background up close. Um, and you guys make sure to check out our Sharks for Kids website. Um, we do have actually a salmon shark coloring sheet. So when you go in, that's a fun one if you're really interested and some other activities. And make sure to stay tuned for our upcoming webinars. But Thank you so much, Andy, for sharing such an incredible adventure and all this information with us. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks, guys. Thank you.